few cases truly capture both the imagination of those looking at it as well as the frustration of what those directly involved had to endure as a result of it then the disappearance case of 22 year old Catherine Eggleston more well known as Katie Eggleston a young woman destined for great things in this world who as far as we know and can understand was deprived of her chance to do great things in this world Steve, the amateur historian. How are you all doing today? Now, as you know, I've had for the last couple of months kind of an ongoing series about uh, mysterious murders, mysterious disappearances, unidentified uh, murder victims, things of that nature. And most of those videos, I have to do the storytelling from my own home because the locations where they happened are too far away for me to get to, at least easily. However, today's story is a Portland-based one, so I'm actually able to go to the locations, some of the locations that correlate with this story. And that being said, what the story I'm gonna tell you today is a very, very tragic one. One about a very ambitious young woman with likely a great future lying ahead of her who has been missing now for more than 27 years. So Catherine Katie Eggleston was originally from Redmond, Oregon, which is off in Central Oregon, pretty good distance uh, east, southeast of Portland. And she attended Oregon State University. Uh, she graduated uh, in June uh, 1993. So she was 22 years old, just finished college, ready for the world. And before the summer had even really taken off, she had already gotten herself a really good job with a communications company called All Net Communications. So she's fresh out of college, she's 22, she's got you know her first post-college job and it's a good job. This was, you know, not, this is not a deadbeat. Uh, by any stretch of the imagination. This was not an irresponsible young woman who would just suddenly snap and disappear of her own volition one day. This was a woman who was just getting her life started and life was good. This was a pushing forward, productive, ambitious young woman with an incredibly bright future. And that brings us to August 2nd, 1993. So Katie's primary workplace was based out of Lake Oswego, just southwest of Portland. And April 2nd just happened to be the first day that Katie was finally gonna go out on her own and do solo appointments on her own for the company. It had to be a, a major, exciting, you know, next step forward in life, altering experience for her. So according to known information on the case, August 2nd was a Monday, so start of the work week.
and she came back during the early morning hours of August 2nd and he she was currently uh, living with her sister Janet Taylor who was 37 years old by my understanding the newspaper said that she was 15 years older than Katie and she was living in Gresham Katie had just recently relocated to the Portland area for the first time so that was a temporary living situation was living in Gresham east of town with her sister apparently her sister was already in bed by the time she came home and Katie was gone to work before she woke up and Katie already had a pretty busy day going. The day started with a work meeting at her, you know, primary, I guess you could say headquarters that she worked out, worked out of. And according to information gained by the police, she'd hit up a succession of different spots before ultimately ending up in the, the neighborhood that I'm in now, which is the Lloyd district. It's where Lloyd Center Mall is. There's a lot of corporate buildings and even the Rose Quarter where the Memorial Coliseum, the Moda Center, it's all kind of in this area. But before then, again, there was a work meeting that Katie had and then she reportedly tra traversed way across town and ended up in Northeast Portland. This here is where Whitaker, Northeast Whitaker Way starts on 122nd. And from here, it goes between all of these, uh, you know, industrial commercial business type buildings. That's pretty much all that's along the stretch from here to 138th, about 16 blocks this way. Now we're pretty far from Lake Oswego, we're pretty far from even like the downtown Portland area or the Lloyd district where Katie Eggleston would ultimately end up later um, in the early afternoon, the day she disappeared. But again, according to official information after her morning meeting, she was making, uh, she was like do doing business up here. And they said she was doing it on Whitaker Way. This road is again, like most stuff in this area. This is an industrial business park type area. All the streets look like this. It's just a succession of large kind of nondescript buildings, warehouses, things of that nature. So she spent a chunk of the, you know, earlier part of her work day along this stretch doing business before she ultimately turned and started heading towards the Lloyd district which would probably be from here over 120 blocks this direction. And from that location way off Northeast Portland, I mean, we're talking 120 some blocks that way. Katie returned, uh, I guess travel more towards where I'm at now, again in the Lloyd district, which is still Northeast Portland, but the Western sector. And reportedly she visited a bank and she also visited a service station, probably to fill up with gas. She drove a Volkswagen, uh, almost, well, you always wanna say bug afterward. She drove a Volkswagen Golf, which that particular car, that particular model uh, has strong prevalence in this case. So it's unknown the exact route that Katie would have taken to come back in this area, but it is known that she came from the Northeast and ultimately ended up in the vicinity of Northeast 7th Avenue. And how do we know that Katie ended up in the vicinity of Northeast 7th Avenue? because the next spot she was seen before going to an actual appointment was at a Burger King, which was located on 7th, is just right up the road here. And here,
here is the Burger King in question, standing along 7th Avenue between Halsey, which is this main street, and Weedler, which is the next street down. So, presumably, it's pushing the two o'clock hour. I can only assume Katie was just getting some food into her system before her next big thing uh, of the day. And so, from this Burger King, she only had to travel a couple of blocks south to this big building right here. Now this behemoth of a building behind me is today, I believe it's just called the 700 building because it's at the 700 block. Uh, it's along 7th, essentially. So 700 block of Multnomah. And back in 1993, this was called, it was referred to as the Port of Portland building in newspapers. And I believe about a little bit before two o'clock, Katie Eggleston came to this building. She was meeting with a client to do a sale with. And during her time here, you know, aside from these treks she went on, everything seemed to be going normal. She was doing business. She stopped at Burger King probably to get some power food in her system and hit up a few other locations, but nothing was amiss until she was in this building. And as many as five witnesses said that when they saw her in this building, she appeared both nervous and, she, she appeared nervous and distracted and kind of concerned, which obviously I never met her, but that seemed to be kind of out of character for her. She was this you know young, ambitious woman ready for the next challenge in life. And they said that while they saw her in this building here, that she appeared troubled, concerned, maybe even scared. A couple of days before she uh, was last seen, she was last seen on a Monday. On the Friday before that, she had gone to the 700 building with her supervisor with, uh, to specifically establish appointments in that building for Monday at 2 p.m. So she'd already been to the place once to pre-establish these appointments. It creates some conflict and intrigue. And of course, conflict is all over this case because there's so many things that we don't know what they mean necessarily. And in this particular case, people noted that when Katie went to do her appointment, again, she appeared nervous and distracted and preoccupied. Now, is that because she was fearing for her safety, that someone had messed with her and whoever that was abducted her shortly after? You can make that inference, but at the same time, this was her first day doing a major presentation at her new job. And for all we know, she could have had, you know, first day jitters. We don't know. Katie also reportedly made some calls while she was in this building. I, I never found exactly what those calls were, who she made them to. That may have just been information that the police didn't release or that you'd have to have some deep connection to know. But the last time, as far as I can see, the last time she was seen, she was seen by the, man, the particular individual that she had like just done business with uh, in this building. And this man said that the last time he saw her, she was exiting out of an elevator in this building. Um, I'd even try to go inside to ask if I could get a shot of the elevator, but I saw on the doors, it's all like, oh, key cards only. Like, this is a very, like, you gotta work here to be in here building. But anyway, the last time she was seen was by this guy she had just done business with, so he would understandably recognize her. And she was exiting off the building's elevator with a man, a dark, darkly complected man with dark hair who was wearing a blue blazer. He saw them exit off together. Now, maybe they were just getting off the elevator at the same time, but based on his description, it seemed more like he got the impression that they were traveling together. Uh, so it's, it's hard to say. And the when, and more importantly, how, Katie Eggleston departed from this building are crucial questions here. Now again, 
This was a woman who had her own car. She was driving around town doing her business. So theoretically, when she was done doing business here, she would have gotten into her car and left to pursue further business. She had a work meeting at 5 p.m. that day. She would have had to have gone back down towards Lake Oswego at some point. So this here, this building is known uh, generally as the Kaiser Permanente building. I know my best friend got stuck on the roof of this building once, um, but back in 1993, it was referred to as the 500 building, which makes sense if you look over here, you can see the 500. So this is obviously has a 500 address. And from this area, this is 6th and Multnomah, you only have to look one block east and this is the 700 building where Katie Eggleston was last seen. So there was a guy named John Davis who reported that he was standing in front of this building, the 500 building, and he would have been standing probably right you know, in the vicinity generally of where this white car is behind me, just kind of along the building. Um, not down on 5th Avenue over here, but a block over here on 6th Avenue, the east side of the building. And he said that just a couple of minutes before 5 p.m., he saw a Volkswagen Golf matching, you know, make, model, color of Katie Eggleston's Volkswagen. Now, this was roughly two and a half hours after she was perceivably done doing business in this area. So it really didn't make any sense why her car would still be in this neighborhood. Now again, Davis said that he saw her car parked in the Port of Portland building's parking lot. So that building is here. Now I was just sitting on the other side of the building that has now been changed into like, you know, kind of a hangout, sit down, break room area. There's a little elevator that probably takes you, I don't know, to underground parking or whatever. That may have been a parking lot at one time, I'm not sure, but also right across from the building, there's a big parking lot right up here. So I'm not sure, since it was referenced as specifically being the Port of Portland building's parking lot, it may have been that area that's now used for like people to chill and hang out at, but it very well could have been right across the street here, it's hard to say. But the fact of the matter is we have a witness describing a Volkswagen Golf identical to Katie Eggleston's car, and it's still parked here just a few minutes before 5 p.m., which again is a problem because Katie has a five o'clock meeting way down in Lake Oswego. What is she doing, perceivably still hanging out in this area? That's what, you know, that's, that's the perspective that would be reached if you think, oh, her car's still here. And what lingers is so frustrating about the Davis account of seeing Katie Eggleston's, possibly Katie Eggleston's car hours after her meeting in the 700 building is, if it's accurate, it's so critical to the official case because it shows that Katie was likely taken from the vicinity of the 700 building. She likely never made it back to her car. And the problem beyond that is simply the fact that there's questions as to why this guy would particularly recognize such a car. Um, it seems unlikely, especially having noticed it, you know, possibly. Why would he notice a random car in a driveway and then a while later after Katie's car is found, he suddenly remembers it? That seems like it would be kind of unlikely and that's kind of where you have some of the arguing back and forth. And as a Volkswagen, uh, to me, Volkswagen vehicles of various sorts, bugs, buses, golfs, um, have always stood out to me on the road. So I could to a degree understand why this guy would possibly remember seeing this car, even though he would have to randomly remember it hours later when after Katie's car was discovered and reported on. And I mean, in the end, the greatest issue of the whole thing is even if he absolutely did see a Volkswagen Golf parked in the vicinity of the 700 building, 
how would we ever know that it was Katie Eggleston's Volkswagen Golf? We just can't. Logistically, I think she'd be doing more more business calls like she was doing earlier in the day. I mean, it's her first day. The whole, you know, the whole world is ahead of her. Is who knows how many people she may be able to potentially call. It seems to me that's what she would be doing next. However, if she's taken shortly after she leaves the 700 building, that would explain why she wouldn't do any more business calls that day. So you know, I, I wonder, was she taken shortly after? Because it seems to me when you've got almost three hours before you have to be back at your workplace in Lake Oswego and it's your first day and you're itching to do good, you would be back on doing business calls. You'd be making everything out of that first day. Based on everything I've read about Katie Eggleston, it seems like she would be that kind of person. I'm now at the location of 12807 Northeast Airport Way, which is approximately where this entryway directly behind me is located, give or take a number or two. You'll notice there's a big parking lot from here all the way over to there. Now about 12.30 a.m., so it's now August 3rd. This is, you know, maybe just a little over 10 hours after Katie Eggleston is at least officially last seen. A security guard working here found her Volkswagen parked in this lot here. And it was very interesting. It, it was like the car had been parked and just left there without a care in the world. The keys were in the ignition, the windows were rolled down. Uh, it was like whoever put the car there didn't care who found it. But what's very intriguing and very important is that Katie's purse was found in the car. And within that purse was most of her belongings, including her credit cards and cash. This is important for a few reasons. One, obviously robbery was not the motive for her disappearance because her cash and stuff was left behind. Now, obviously Katie was not there with the car. It was just the car somehow it had gotten from all the way over at the Lloyd District to here, which there's something like a nine mile gap between the two and somebody had to get the car here, but nobody knows who. One of the instances in this case, probably the one that's most open to speculation is how did Katie's car get from the 700 building to a parking lot along Airport Way? The two locations are approximately nine miles apart. It obviously had to get there some way, and it was presumed early on that whoever may have taken her took the car and put it there uh, for whatever reason, to ditch it, to try to throw people off. Um, the, the fact that you know the windows were rolled down, the doors were unlocked, the keys were left in the ignition. There's been theorization that the car was left there in the hopes that someone in the area might see it 
and steal it, which could work because if somebody gets caught driving the stolen car of a girl that's just gone missing, it'll throw shade on them in relation to the case as opposed to whoever actually left the car. However, at the same time, the only way that plan works is if someone actually steals the car, which didn't happen, obviously. So there's, there's been numerous reasons put forth as to why whoever the perpetrator might be in Katie's case would have taken the car and put it there. There's been reasons put forth why she would have been the one to drive the car there. And what personally interests me the most in terms of the possibility that Katie Eggleston may have actually driven the car to that site along airport way herself is the fact that she was literally just a couple blocks away from that location earlier that day. And that's been something that a lot of people want to talk about is, isn't it interesting that earlier that day when she was making business calls, she was on Whitaker Way, which runs parallel and just a couple blocks south of Airport Way where her car was found. So she's there, she goes way over to the 700 building in the Lloyd District. And then later on, her car's found back right around the area she was earlier. Now, I read that All Net Communications, where she worked, it was an extremely competitive uh, business. And one of the things that happened in their, um, their structure of business is they let uh, employees pick particular like regions to like focus their sales calls in. So, you know, one person might be working this primary area. So if that's the case, it makes absolute sense for Katie Eggleston to have been there earlier trying to do business calls, showing that maybe that was part of her region. It makes total sense that she would later go back there possibly to make more business calls. Now, the problem with that is as far as I've been able to find, there's no proof that she did any more business calls up in that area. Again, after she left the 700 building, we don't know what happened to her. It's a situation open for all kinds of speculation. I read so many, so people have so many random questions, random theories. Why would the perpetrator put the car here? Why would she do that? And the fact of the matter is that for all the speculation in the world one may do on this case, the fact of the matter is we really only have two sets of facts in this regard. Katie Eggleston was last seen around 2.15 p.m. leaving the 700 building uh, in the company of another gentleman. The next fact we have is that her car was found at the approximate site of 128th and Airport Way by a security guard at 12.30 a.m., a little over 10 hours after she was last seen. That's all we know for certain. So the first and really only potential suspect in the case, and I think even referring to him as a suspect is a stretch, was Katie's boyfriend, whom she'd reportedly broken up with when she visited him that weekend 
leading to her disappearance. So that's always suspicious. You break up with a boyfriend and then vanish the next day. And Katie's own father, Paul Eggleston, said that, you know, when they started searching and her boyfriend showed up, Paul said that he was acting, acting very strangely and that he was suspicious that maybe her boyfriend had been responsible for this and reported this to the police and the police looked into it and determined that he had been in Portland randomly. It's the guy that lived in Medford. He'd been in Portland on Monday when Katie vanished. Why would he be in Portland? Uh, I mean, other than to probably see her, but they just saw each other. So did he go back and try to win her over, to win her back, and that went astray and he ended up abducting her or harming her in some way? So everybody was pretty much convinced real quick that her boyfriend may have seriously been responsible for this. And then the day after Paul Eggleston learned of this information, the police came back and said, no, the boyfriend actually wasn't in Portland. He was, he was, he was somewhere else uh, the day that Katie disappeared. So why they botched that information too, who's to say? But it appears that Katie's father uh, came, came to terms with that and any animosity that may have existed for a brief period between her and Katie's uh, former boyfriend, they buried the hatchet after that. So I think it was pretty, pr they were all pretty much convinced that he wasn't involved. This intersection that I'm now approaching, this is Southeast 122nd and Stark. So we fast forward to 2001. It's been some eight years since Katie Eggleston disappeared. And a potential witness comes forward, a man who worked at a service station here at 122nd and Stark, being the crossing street, would claim that at approximately the day that Katie disappeared, he saw a woman that he was pretty sure was her in a vehicle arrive at the service station he worked at. Now, the area I'm standing in is a parking lot. There's a Hertz over there. There's a closed down Burgerville over there. The only place where there's still a service station here is this Astro station, which is on the northeast corner of the intersection and was likely here in 1993. So this was likely the service station uh, in question and the service station employee stated that he saw a woman that he was pretty sure was Katie Eggleston show up in a vehicle again this is approximately around the time that she disappeared now the station employee that worked here stated that he saw this woman two different times on the day that he saw her the first time she showed up she reportedly asked him for directions on how to get to the airport which, interestingly enough, Katie's car would later be found on Airport Way just off 122nd. So just a few miles directly this way is where her car was found. And it was a brief visit and she was gone. Now, this attendant said this woman later returned in a different vehicle with two uh, African-American men with her. And now she was driving a different vehicle. She was driving reportedly a Honda hatchback and she looked emotionally wrought. She was crying. She looked like, she, uh, the attendant described it as she looked like she was trying to get someone's attention. And when they finally departed, she was apparently driving the vehicle. So it's, it's interesting that she's like crying, trying to get someone's attention, but she's driving the vehicle. And so it appeared that she just left with these two mystery men anyway. And the attendant said that when she drove off, this woman, who again, he was pretty sure was Katie Eggleston, when they drove off, he said that she peeled out on the road and was driving so erratically that he almost called the police to report her as a drunk driver.
However, it was more that the story didn't break news. It didn't get to the people till 2001, but it wasn't the first time the guy told this story. He contacted authorities, the people in control of the case. He contacted them after the experience had happened and then he had seen Katie Eggleston's picture on the news and he thought she looks identical to the woman I saw. So in effect, he actually reported this pretty much right after it happened. He reported it to the people in charge and they dismissed him because he said that there were two African-American men that were traveling with this woman he saw and the police said they were looking for a white man with a southern accent. So presumably this individual had a southern accent. So they were they were honing in on whoever this mystery man was at the time. However, how did the police know that this guy was white? All the guy did was call. All they, they, they heard his voice, they never saw his face, they have no clue who he was. And yet they dismissed an eyewitness account for the sake of this story, and I really don't understand that at all. And let me just say, if you're gonna say, oh, well, white people and black people have distinctively different accents, that's just how it is. You are treading very dangerous water. It's not only is that very racist, but it's also inherently inaccurate. So, this was reported in the immediate aftermath, and those in charge chose to dismiss it, to not take it seriously, because of a presumption about the race of this man who made this call taking responsibility for Katie's death. And it wiped this possibility completely off the map for them. And it didn't come to the light of day again for eight years. And let's just say for a moment this gas station attendant story is factual, or true. The woman he saw was Katie Eggleston. It was on the day she vanished. You know, again, he said the first time he saw her, she was dressed real nice. He even said that she had what looked like a thick black book in her passenger seat. And people at All Night Communications said that the employee work binder was like a thick zipper up notebook uh, kind of thing. So was he seeing her binder in her seat before she vanished? You, you'd have to think like, well, obviously these two men abducted her. Why they would be uh, in a different car makes sense. It would be the car they had. They would abduct her and take her. But from there, there's lots of questions. Why would they be having the woman they took captive doing the driving for them? You know, when she could potentially swerve here when they don't want her to, or she could suddenly stop real quick and try to leap from the car and scream for help, or scream for help. Why would they be having her driving? Why would they be out to be seen driving around at all? Why would they stop at a service station with her, knowing that they would be seen? Those are the questions that really complicate matters in this. And it, it, it has to be understood. That particular area, 122nd and Stark, not a great area today. Back in the 80s and early 90s, it was a really rough area all around there. It was a really rough area so unfortunately to see you know some guys pull into a station with a woman who maybe looked haggard and fear fearful that wouldn't have necessarily been an extremely rare thing in that area so like so many other things it leaves us wondering and wanting It's never been released exactly what service station she went to. 
So it's kind of interesting that if this is her, she shows up at this service station, you know, again during the day. Was this the service station she went to? We, we don't know. Wouldn't that be a, a great revelation in this case, especially since the authorities took it with a total grain of salt? That when all is said and done, they find out that the one that this gas station in particular, and I, I would figure authorities would know what gas station it was. What if it was revealed that the gas station in question was at 122nd and Stark, where this guy says that he saw this woman who was dressed seemingly similar to Katie and seemed to maybe have her all net communications book. One of the complications is he couldn't remember the car that she was in earlier that day. He remembered when he saw her again later that they were driving a Honda hatchback, but he, all he really knew was that it was a different car from what she was driving earlier. So that's unfortunate. One of the main detectives in the case, Detective Terry Wagner, uncovers that both Katie's sister Janet and her former husband, Jeffrey Taylor, were both in some trouble in relation to their taxes. They were being charged essentially with tax evasion for the years 1986 and 1987. And I guess theoretically because Katie is Janet's sister and Katie's living with her in Gresham, it was deemed there might be a connection. And so quickly a theory was put forth that Katie left of her own volition to avoid having to testify in relation to her sister and her former brother-in-law's tax case. So this abrupt shift in the case pretty much severed at least good relations between the Egglestons and the officers in charge of the case. They, the moment that they found out that this, that these uh, tax evasion trials were going on, they immediately just went that way. And in fact, they were so confrontational with Paul Eggleston, who again, his daughter has just vanished. He's going through this horrible thing. They, not in so many words, inferred that not only was Katie fine, but that her father knew where she was. And I'm thinking if, if, if they really, if she really is going to concoct this escape, fleeing into the darkness, wouldn't she probably I don't know, maybe she wouldn't, but don't you think she would probably alert her parents? Well, it's not so much that she would alert her parents, but it's that if the implication is Paul Eggleston knows where she is, that means that she informed him and probably other family members of what she was planning on doing. So if that's the case, why would he stir the pot, come to Portland, raise a big stink and go so far to try to find out where his daughter is if he knows where she's at and knows that pushing the authorities to solve the case is only going to probably reveal that his daughter really didn't disappear. And you can get in a lot of trouble for that kind of stuff. So made absolutely no sense. But the police were convinced that she was fine and that Family members like Paul Eggleston knew where she was. They even asked him to take a polygraph test, which he took and passed to what should be nobody's surprise. Katie Eggleston disappears August 2nd, 1993. Her sister, who's the only one in this dynamic that she'd really have a reason to want to really do something for. Apparently, her and the family in general didn't have much of a connection to Jeffrey at all. 
Janet takes a plea deal. July 9th, 1993, more than three weeks before Katie Eggleston disappears. Her connection in the matter is done. But despite how absurd this thing was on its face, and what made it even more absurd was it was made more about her sister. She did this for her sister, but her sister had already taken a plea deal a couple weeks earlier. It was reported in a Portland Tribune article that uh, Katie's father, Paul, got a call from Detective Wagner saying, you know, essentially, is there anything you're not telling me? And then saying like, why didn't you tell me about this tax evasion case? And it was like, well, who in their right mind would think there was a connection? And even Detective Wagner said, considering those circumstances, anybody with like, what is it she said? It was like, paraphrasing, anybody with common sense would see that this is a possibility that she would split down because of this. Even though it made no sense whatsoever. It was truly, it was wild to one degree, but it was insulting and detrimental to the case as a whole. But this police theory doesn't hit the papers till the middle of October. It's, you know, two months later before it suddenly starts showing up in the papers. Oh, you know, the, the law enforcement thinks Katie Eggleston may have left on her own. And why they would wait that long when it seems like they had that theory pretty quickly is definitely up for consideration. that information hits the papers. Law enforcement thinks Katie ran off, again, of her own volition to avoid having to be a part of this case, which even other people in her family said she would have been a, a minor witness at best. And I, what's most tragic, one of these articles, the last sentence, literally said like, e you know, even if there was a connection in this case between uh, Katie and her sister and brother-in-law's tax evasion cases. And I'm just thinking, what connection? What connection could she possibly have? These, this was a case in relation to tax evasion, 1986, 1987. Katie Eggleston was only 22 years old in 1993, which means she was 15, 16 years old when this stuff was happening. Still living in Redmond, presumably in high school. What connection? What in-depth connection could she possibly have to this case? But that is what the police, or at least the you know law enforcement officials who were presiding over the case, that is what they kept pushing. And Katie had gone home to retrieve this passport several days before she vanished. So the fact that she had gotten it that close and the fact that it wasn't found after she disappeared um, made the theory pretty simple. She was planning on fleeing, not just fleeing the Portland area, but she was planning on going international, going to another country. So she had to get her passport so that she could fly, presumably fly out of the country. Now the problem with that is one, there's no, there's, there's no proof that she ever le that she left Portland of her own volition. Um, that there's no evidence that she bought a plane ticket, anything. And you know, again, when her car was found, but her purse was still there with a bunch of her belongings, including all of her credit cards and her cash. So she was going to leave the country without any money. And if if there was any evidence that she you know, caught a flight out of the country, that evidence would have been presented by law enforcement because they were trying to push that angle. If they found evidence to prove that, of course they would move forward with it. But all they really had was this passport. And according to Katie's own mother, she came and picked up the passport. That was in relation to her work. It was to, you know, validate her, I guess, as a, uh, you know, US citizen. It was, it was entirely related to 
her all net communications business. So there was a reason why she came and got it. And her mom even suggested she probably would have carried it in her work binder that she had, which also was never recovered. Now, one might think she disappears, her car's left in a random parking lot along Airport Way, Maybe Katie Eggleston just split town. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but maybe that's what happened. She fled to the airport and left. Well, one thing you have to understand about Portland is Airport Way goes a long distance. The location right behind me where her car was found, we're three miles from the Portland International Airport. Someone who was gonna try to flee the city real quick wouldn't leave their car so far away. And if you would, I, I mean, what, what would you be doing other than maybe trying to conceal where your car is? But if you're trying to conceal your car, why would you leave it in a big parking lot? A parking lot so big that there's security perusing the lot, which is how her car was found. It is genuinely, genuinely baffling that the police would go in this direction other than the fact that they were just looking for something to get it taken care of, to get it off their books and it prevents them from having to invest more time in investigating. If you become convinced as you know, the individuals who are in charge of investigating a case that, oh, this person just ran away, well then you justify it in your own mind that you don't have to look into it. But even the prosecutor in the case of Janet, Katie's sister, uh, it was a guy named William Fitzgerald. He even said that Katie was a quote, non-essential witness in her case. And both Fitzgerald and Assistant U.S. Attorney Claire Fay, who was the one who indicted the case, so these were people that were directly involved in Janet's trial, both of them stated the police never even came to talk to them about the matter. So what does that tell you? And in, in fact, when Paul Eggleston brought up the case of John Davis, the guy who saw this car by the 700 building that looked, you know, just like Katie's Volkswagen Golf. He brought this up to one of the lead detectives and the lead, he said that the lead detective didn't even recognize the name. So there was multiple people that would have prevalence in this case, even if not to benefit this obscene theory that Katie left on her own. And a bunch of them, it seems, were left completely unaddressed. How can you, how can you be genuinely investigating a case like this and you don't even recognize the name of someone who's one of very few witnesses in this case? That's the thing, this is not a case with a hundred different witnesses who saw her here, here, there, there. This is one of the only people that provided information potentially helpful to Katie's cause after she went missing that day. And detective on the case doesn't even recognize the name. This, this is the greatest, you know, this is the greatest tragedy of the whole thing beyond the likely loss of life considering Katie Eggleston's been missing for more than 27 years now, but it's just, this is unfortunately why a lot of cases seem to not get solved. And granted, this is a complex one. This is one where there's just so little to go on. But the fact of the matter is it doesn't seem like the authorities in charge were that invested in the moment they had a scapegoat to use, that being these tax evasion trials of Katie's sister and one-time brother-in-law. They just latched onto that and nothing else mattered. And that is horrendous. And the fact that this case was so horribly handled then and it's just kind of sat on the shelves collecting dust in the prevailing years is just an extension of this horrid tragedy regarding this young woman who 
had so much potential in life and obviously wanted to do so much with her life. And she just vanished. And it seems aside from those close to her, nobody really cared. That's what it seems like. There was another woman named Susan Ray Hostler from Milwaukee who vanished. It was several months after Katie disappeared. It was February 19th, 1994. She vanished from the Oregon City Shopping Center, which place I've been to many times from the parking lot there. She was seen leaving with a mystery man that got into her truck with her and then just vanished. Three days after her disappearance, her truck was discovered out in the Columbia River Gorge, a good ways east of Portland near Multnomah Falls. And a couple weeks after that, a man who was apparently out looking for his cat stumbled onto a dead body that was ultimately um, identified as belonging or being Hostler's body. And they started looking into her case as possibly being connected to Katie Eggleston's case, primarily due to the fact that her vehicle was also left abandoned somewhere. But beyond that, like Katie Eggleston, the keys were found in the ignition, the doors were unlocked, and at least one of the windows to Hostler's truck was rolled down. So it was it was an almost identical setup. And, you know, it looked like the truck was being left there, you know, abandoned, maybe he, like someone would steal it. Um, and then her body was found about 200 feet away from where her truck was abandoned, which it doesn't seem like the same would be the case for Katie Eggleston, who's Again, body has never been found, but I also read in the newspapers that apparently one of Hostler's children belonged to a swim club that Katie Eggleston also belonged to. Um, so it was interesting, and you could kind of see why for a brief while authorities maybe thought there was a connection. And uh, Todd Allen Reed, a guy who was apprehended in 1999 for murdering three uh, homeless women, and leaving their bodies in Forest Park in the West Hills near um, on the west side of Portland, he was briefly looked into as possibly being responsible for Hostler's disappearance. I don't think he was ever looked into as possibly being um, guilty for Katie Eggleston's disappearance. And he, had, by the time he was busted for these Forest Park cases, he was being looked into in several cases dating all the way back to the 1980s. And apparently he matched a description of the man that got into Hostler's truck with him or with her but that was about where the connections ended and again it seemed like reed targeted homeless prostitutes uh which didn't match hostler and certainly didn't match katie eggleston and sadly as the 90s gave away to the new millennium there hasn't really been a whole lot that has happened in this case. It's just kind of lingered. Uh, and primarily, you know, you don't know what happened to the victim. You don't know where they ended up. You don't even have a specific crime scene. I mean, those are the ones that are just the hardest. You won't, you need somebody who saw something to say something definitive or you need luck a lot of times. Um, the one key thing that did happen and it is, um, uh, it is still a lingering possibility. I haven't really seen anybody talking about it much recently, but back in 2006, a guy named Joel Courtney was looked into as possibly being a suspect in Katie Eggleston's disappearance. And as far as I know, he was never, he hasn't been proven to have done it, but he hasn't been dismissed as being a possible suspect still. This is a guy who was born in the Portland area, uh, one of the one of the difficult things to pin this guy down on is he's traveled around so much. He's been in and out of Portland a lot during his life. But this is the guy that was ultimately busted and admitted to abducting and killing Brooke Wilberger in 2004, I believe. And that, that was a huge, um, huge disappearance. And the guy has a track record of 
um, trying to abduct women. He got busted for it in New Mexico where he was. Um, they found Brooke Wilberger's DNA in this guy's van and he ultimately admitted to it. And people have contemplated whether he is res possibly responsible for Katie Eggleston's disappearance. As I understand it, he was living, or at least he was generally in the Portland area at the time that she went missing. And it appears he targeted young women, uh, late teens to early 20s, and it was often blonde-haired, blue-eyed women, which uh, Katie Eggleston fits right into that. And people have, have kind of looked at her how she looked and then at Brooke Wilberger and while they, they certainly have their differences there are a lot of comparisons in their appearance so Katie Eggleston does match the the type of, of uh, victim that uh, Joel Courtney would go after unfortunately like a lot of other things I think at this point there's just no evidence to time to it at this time and with her case happening over 27 years ago it's 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 kind of hard to think that they're gonna find um, any evidence on this guy, but that, that was the biggest thing that's happened in the 21st century, so to speak, is that he's come under interest. And I know the FBI said they were looking into him for three possible cases. Um, two of them he was dismissed from, and they wouldn't mention what the third case was they were looking into, but right around the time this was happening, uh, Paul Eggleston said that authorities came and discussed with him this possibility of Joel Courtney maybe being responsible for Katie's disappearance. So you want to think that other case the FBI was talking about was Katie's case. Uh, but that's that's where we're that's where we're sitting right now. And I really really hope um, at some point we somehow find out what happened. I mean this this case really drew me in and I did this video based on everything I was able to find. Obviously, I'm not going to have as many details as investigators, uh, you know, everything that's in their crime file on it and so on and so forth. So some of this video has been me theorizing and saying, well, what if this is the case and what if that's the case? And that's just because I want to keep the dialogue going while considering things that I just don't have the answers to. And there's unfortunately a lot of these, a lot of things in this case that we don't have answers to. And it just, this, this case really drew me in and I really wanted to dedicate some time to doing more than just the general 15 minute, hey, here's this story, blah, blah, blah. I really wanted to kind of immerse myself into this case as much as I could with whatever evidence I could find. And this video is the product of that. Um, as I've always said, I do these videos because these people deserve uh, to be thought about and to be kept in mind and to be remembered no matter how old their cases are just because their cases are from decades past does not mean that these people deserve um, any less concern than someone who disappeared two months ago uh, these people deserve to be remembered and they deserve to have people continue fighting for them um, as long as uh, the resolution to what happened to them is unknown so I really hope sometime, someday in the future, we have a resolution to the case of what happened, who was responsible for the disappearance of Katie Eggleston. All that said, thank you so much for watching. This has been Steve, the Amateur Historian. Catch you next time.